Hello YouTube, this is Jesse Ferguson, Canadian folk musician and a YouTuber here for about seven years. And today I'm going to bring to you another one of my videos in the basic instructional or introductions to various instruments that I play. This time it's going to be on the djembe, which is an African style of drum, hand drum. But the principles that apply to playing this hand drum will also apply to other types of hand drums like the congas, the bongos, um, various other kinds, uh, certain Middle Eastern types and so on. Uh, I'm sure there's some overlap too with the, uh, the Indian style tablas, I believe they're called. Uh, anyway, so this is uh, a video and for absolute beginners. Maybe you haven't picked one of these up yet or you just bought one and you don't know how to get started. Um, so, I will, however, uh, start off with the usual disclaimer that I give with my, my music introductions is that I'm not a trained musician. I'm largely self-taught. Now that doesn't mean that I haven't learned from other musicians as I've played with them and things like that over the years and watched uh, other YouTube videos and so on, but I'm not a formally trained musician on any instrument. Uh, so you might want to take what I say with a grain of, of salt. Now that being said, with the, uh, the djembe and the hand drum being such a basic uh, musical instrument, well it's the most basic fundamental instrument that's sort of found cross-culturally many different cultures uh, and most people would agree, uh, most historians, that it's probably the most ancient of all musical instruments. In fact, I was just reading on Wikipedia that uh, they found some in China made from alligator skins uh, that date back to about 5000 BC. So quite a, an ancient type of instrument as far as an actual purpose-built instrument. Uh, as opposed to just banging rocks or sticks or something like that, it's probably the oldest. So, and it's also one that you don't really need a lot of instruction on, I find, um, because it's so much governed by your guts. Uh, that's the term that I like to use for it anyway. Um, there's a rhythm inside of you, uh, and uh, you just got to let it out through your body. It's a very body-centered musical instrument. It's a lot less, say, cerebral uh, or intellectual as some others, like, for instance, maybe the violin or something like that. At least that's the way I view it. It's really, you know, sort of body-centered. You're using your entire body, getting that rhythm out. Um, and the kind of rhythms that are best suited to the djembe, I find, are the ones that really have that sort of quality of engaging your body in sort of a dance and things like that, which originally was the intention, to bring people together and they would dance and play uh, drum and so on. So, in other words, if what I say, you know, in terms of technique doesn't work for you, you can look at other YouTube videos. There are lots of them on YouTube here, and many of them are, are great and much more skilled and accomplished djembe players. My, this is not my primary instrument. Um, I've been playing djembes and uh, other types of hand drums. I have a set of bongos also, which are at my parents' place. Uh, but I've been playing for roughly 15 years or so on various drums. Uh, so I do have a lot of experience, but I've never been formally trained again. My main instrument is the guitar. Uh, which I sing along to, but I like to bring this whenever I go to uh, house parties and uh, jam sessions. I like to bring it along, and so I throw it in the mix, uh, pass it around to other people who want to play, but I also play it myself periodically at these various parties and so on. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, once you get one, you'll find that it's addictive. You can get into sort of a trance of playing the drum for long periods of time, much possibly to the annoyance of whoever you live with, uh, but uh, there's something primal in it. It speaks to everyone, a drum. Um, especially played, you know, in a sort of upbeat, sort of engaging tempo that might encourage people to dance. It's really engaging and you'll get into the zone. Uh, you don't have to have an expensive drum. You don't have to take any lessons. This is something that you can get set up with very cheaply and have a, a lot of great uh, fun with it. So, that's the disclaimer. Uh, okay, so, uh, how to choose a drum. Now, if you haven't bought one yet, or if you have one and you're not happy with it, here are some tips that I recommend for picking one out. So this is a djembe. It's a kind of uh, goblet drum, uh, or I think they call it where it's shaped like a goblet. So in other words, this is the cup and this is the stem. So if you had a goblet for drinking wine. Um, so you can get them in various sizes. Uh, some of them are, you know, about twice as large as, as mine. Um, and uh, not that much, not twice as tall though, generally speaking. The ones I've seen anyway. Um, you have a hardwood shell body. I have a smaller one here, which I'll talk about in a second. And you have what they call the drum head, which is the skin, usually made of rawhide. Uh, in a djembe, it's almost always made of goat rawhide. Um, and then it's tuned with ropes. So in other words, the ropes provide the tension that keeps the head on. 
So it's not the only kind of drum that works that way. A lot of Native American drums also have ropes that pull the, uh, the, the, the rawhide onto the frame. But this is an African style one. And uh, so those are the basic components. So when you're choosing one, you have basically two options to, well, three options to get them. One is to buy one online, which is going to cost you a lot in shipping. And you may end up with a drum that's not very good because you won't be there to test it out. So I really strongly recommend don't order one online um, because you'll probably be paying almost half of what the, the price would be on shipping because it's so big and heavy. Um, so in other words, if you bought one in person, even if that involved going to the nearest city, you'd probably still save some money and could buy a superior drum uh, for the same amount of money. And uh, so what else? So if you go in person, you have basically two options. One is to go to an actual music shop where you will probably find a more consistently high quality drum, but uh, generally speaking, more expensive because they're geared towards musicians. Now the section, second option is to go to uh, an import store or uh, sort of a decor store that specializes in uh, imports from Asia and Africa. So whenever I bought this one, it was at uh, an African import store in Ottawa, Ontario, uh, where I was studying at school. And uh, they had, you know, 25 or 30 various djembes, all of different sizes, and uh, much cheaper than buying it at a music store. Now, the only drawback there is if you get it from one of those import stores, um, a lot of them are what we consider decorative djembes. So in other words, they're not really meant to be played. They're not uh, crafted to the same quality standards as the musician-grade ones that you find in the music store. But that being said, you can still find uh, good drums in those import stores. You just have to be a little bit more careful, in other words. Um, so this one and my other one were both bought from uh, non-music stores. This one I actually bought at Winners for 15 bucks. It has a nice little sound. I don't know the country of manufacture. I think this one, because it was from an African import store, is from Africa. But uh, this one has a goat head, hardwood body, some nice carving on it. It's quite a nice little piece. Um, goat skin, and you can see the fur is still on the rim where they folded it over. It was obviously a goat uh, hide with the skin on top, and they put it over the drum first and then shaved the top with some kind of shaving technique uh, tool. So you can see that there's actually fur still in the, in the crack, which gives it a nice rustic look. Now, <laughs> I had a problem with this drum whenever I bought it, that there were actually some bugs eggs inside the fur here uh, that came out in my apartment. So what I had to do was tie it up in a glad bag for a month with some mothballs and it killed off the bugs. So word to the wise, watch out for that. I imagine if they, they removed the fur first, that wouldn't have been an issue. So. How did I know this was a good one? Well, for one thing, uh, there aren't any, uh, well, there aren't a lot of major cracks going up the side of the shell. That's something you will often find in many djembes, is cracking at the rim, or the butt end where it opens up. It's hollow on the inside. Um, this one has a small one, which hasn't moved since I bought it. So in other words, it's not an issue. If you get one and it has a crack, then the best thing to do is to treat the whole drum with oil to prevent further cracking, but you don't want ones that are cracked all the way up or uh, you know cracked in multiple places. Generally, cracking is not the greatest idea. Uh, is not great. It, this one doesn't affect the sound or the structural integrity, I don't think. So, I haven't considered it a problem. Um, the inside's hollow, so you might want to look on the inside at how the uh, the skin looks. Now you can't really see here very well, but you can see the inside of the. Uh, of the the skin, the drum head, uh, you're not really getting much of a sense of that. But you can inspect the inside as well, in addition to the front of the head. Now the, the head itself is obviously very important for the sound. You want to make sure it doesn't have any cracks, any uh, spots that seem really thin to you. You want to have it ideally already at a sort of reasonable tension. So just go through the pile that they have, including at the music store or if you get it at the, at the import store, Pick them up off the ground, don't test it on the ground because that will muffle a lot of the sound coming out down here. Um, pick them up under your arm, or whatever you need to do, or if it's a really large one, tilt it on the ground so that some of the air, some of the sound can come out like that. Just tilt it a little bit. Don't worry what the sales clerk says, just go around and test them all. Give it a good whack. 
if it doesn't sound good to you, then don't buy that drum. That's generally the way to go because it's, uh, you know, it will slightly work in a little bit, the drum skin, after you buy it, after you play it substantially, it will soften it. But generally speaking, if it sounds raspy or dry and there's no flexibility to it, that's probably not the best one to buy. Move on to the next one. So I looked through about 15 or, or 20 of them before I chose this one. And I believe I paid $45 for it. I recall because I had just finished uh, buskering on, in the Byward Market in Ottawa, you know, playing music on the street for, uh, for change. And I bought the drum, tax included, with the earnings from playing for an hour downtown, which was a pretty sweet deal. Uh, so the cordage is another thing you want to consider. You want to find one where, you know, the cordage, the, the knots look neat, the knot work. Um, aside from that, I mean, you'd like something that has decent quality cordage, something that was not all frayed and so on. You know, fit and finish is important, but it doesn't have to be a, a super deal breaker. It doesn't have to be ultra smooth to, to produce a good sound. Sound is the, the number one function. Yes, it is nice to have a nice looking drum as well. So for decor, you put it out and you, you know, you decorate your house partly with your instruments. But sound is, sound is number one if you want to play it. So that's that drum, $45 at African Imports. This one I bought for $15 at Winners, which is a much smaller version, obviously. But uh, it produces a really nice sound. And I thought, $15, how can it be? But uh, I picked it up and played it around in the aisles, which I'm sure people thought I was crazy. But uh, again, you never buy a drum without testing it. Never, never, never. That's my biggest bit of advice in this video. Don't buy one without testing it. Uh, unless you're buying it from someone you trust to test it for you. Um, so that's some nice carving. Again, hollow on the inside. And uh, it's the same, same principle. Obviously it produces a higher pitch. But uh, this one is a much more finished kind of hide. It's, it's more sort of uniform. It doesn't have the, the grain of the hair still attached. But that doesn't really matter in terms of the sound. But it does produce a nice little sound. For a small drum, you can get a reasonable tone and volume out of a small drum if it's tuned properly. In other words, the skin is properly uh, sized, I guess. It's a good piece of skin. It's not too thick, not too thin. Um, and the, the tension on the ropes is appropriate, which can be adjusted. So here's a... That's pretty good tone out of a, what is it? Five, five six inch drum head. Um, so that's the drum head, that's the shell, and the ropes hold the two together in a nutshell. Okay, now, how do you maintain your drum? We'll just briefly talk about that. Once you've got one, you need to maintain it in order for it to keep sounding good. So, first thing first is, as I mentioned before, in order to prevent cracking and just to make sure that the wood lasts well, you can waterproof it somewhat and treat it with, uh, I used uh, mineral oil, uh, which is just uh, baby oil, basically unscented baby oil. You can get a big bottle of it for five bucks. Uh, I've also used on my drums uh, the old English wood treatment oil that you can get at Walmart for again five dollars. But uh, recently I've been leaning more towards a more uh, sort of more natural approach, so I've been putting uh, linseed oil, boiled linseed oil. At any rate, every once in a while, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year, depending on your climate, you want to just oil, especially down around here where the wood is exposed grain, and it will soak up a ton of oil on the first time you do that. So that's a good idea. Oil it. And number two, uh, to treat the head, you want to put uh, some kind of uh, an oil on it. Now, it's goat skin, right? So something that's good for your skin, presumably would also work for goat skin. So the things that I've tried are, um, I tried hand lotion whenever I first started getting into drums, but I was encouraged to use uh, lanolin oil, lanolin, which is produced from sheep's wool. So in other words, if you've got goat skin or... Uh, I think they're both goat skin, all of these, um, including on my, on my Boron here. If it's made from goat, sheep's oil probably won't hurt it, so anyway, that's what I use. You can get that at the pharmacy, lanolin oil, because they, uh, they, uh, they recommend it for nursing mothers to use on their nipples if they're, the baby is biting the nipple too much. So anyway, if it's good enough for human skin, it's probably good enough for goat skin. So every once in a while, uh, you know, once or twice a year, you rub some of that on there, let it sit overnight, and then you take a rag and rub the excess off. And it will be a bit tacky at first, but it will preserve uh, the tone. Because you don't want your skin to get dried out, just like you don't want your own skin to get dried out. So, that's your maintenance for the drum. Um, make sure your hands are clean before you play it. Don't put, play the drum with filthy hands. That includes if you take it to a party and pass it around to your friends. 
you know, don't eat some Doritos and then start playing your drum. Uh, okay. Now, as for the ropes that hold it on, you can adjust the tension of the head by tightening or, or loosening the ropes. Now, if you really want to get involved, you can actually take them all off and redo it. Um, readjust the, the tension. I've never done that in my life. That's why I recommend starting with a drum that's sort of reasonable in tension. But if you have a, a dud, that, or say you move from New York to Arizona, and all of a sudden the, the climate is a lot drier, you're going to notice that your drum head becomes a lot tighter in Arizona because the moisture that's in the air has sort of sucked, or the lack of moisture in the air has sucked moisture out of your skin and makes it dry and tight, just like your, your own skin would get. So what you need to do then is maybe slack it off or put the lanolin oil on it and soften that back up and it will loosen up again. So you'll get the tone you want. Now, for smaller adjustments, I recommend making yourself a couple of little sticks. I just got some dowel rod from, uh, I don't know, the Walmart or something like that. An oak dowel. I think that's a quarter inch or three eighths inch, something like that. And you cut some little sections. And then what you do is you go between grab a, a pencil here. Uh, you can do it also with a piece of pencil, just the pencil is not quite as strong. And so what you do is you insert it between two of the pairs right here. So you see how they run in pairs? Uh, these two. So you put your pencil between and then you would, I'll try to keep this on frame here, you would twist that cordage like that. And the more you want to twist it, the tighter that becomes. You're adding tension to, this, to the cords. Right? So now I've just added two twists to that cord. Obviously if this was smaller it wouldn't be in the way as much. So that's what this, these dowel rods are doing. And I generally tuck it under its, its neighboring pair just to keep it out of the way. So if you had a really slack drum head, you could go around and do that on all of them if you wanted to. And that's a temporary fix that you can adjust based on the seasons, based on how rainy it is that day. So whenever you go to play, the first thing you do is you press down on your skin really hard and that lets you know what the, what the basic tension is going to be that day. If you don't press first, then as you're playing it, it's going to gradually lower in uh, tension. Or raise, depending on uh, what the relative humidity is. So you, can, you can sort of predict the weather based on the, on the tension of your drum head in terms of low and high pressure and humidity and so on. Uh, okay, so that's maintenance. Other than that, they're almost indestructible, these things. I've had my son drop this drum, knock it over, about a hundred times by now, when he was a toddler, and uh, it hasn't broken yet. And I generally just throw it in the trunk whenever I go to a party or jam session, and uh, don't really take a whole lot of care as to how they're treated. So, fairly indestructible. I've had this one for about ten years. Okay, now, uh, Basic playing patterns. Let's get down to the playing. So, how are you going to hold the drum? Well, there are two, well, three basic ways you would want to do it, I guess. One is like this, which is not the traditional way for a djembe. Which you'd play it like that. Um, the more traditional way is between your knees. So let me zoom down for a second here. And show you. I like a chair without any legs, uh, without any arms, that is, yeah, chair without legs would be great. Um, and uh, what I do with it is lock it in between my knees and between my feet, generally. Well, actually, yeah, it's like that. So you see it from the side here. I've got my feet crossed underneath, and the drum head, like so. Sometimes I'll bring it a little bit more uh, parallel to my knees. But uh, make yourself comfortable. Don't hunch over. Don't lean way back. You don't want the drum way out here. You want it comfortably so that when you rest your hands on your, on your lap, that's where you want your drum head. You just rest your hands comfortably on here. Because you don't want to do anything that's going to cause awkward posture because you'll be tired out eventually, possibly even injure yourself. So right about there, that's the sort of classic place to put it. So that's one way to do it. I also like to play on this chair because sometimes I can put my rest my foot on one of the legs here. It's a swivel chair and it has four like a, a sort of cross hair on the bottom or crossed legs on the bottom. 
So I can rest one heel on that and sort of support the operation. Now, the other way to do it would be possibly, I've seen one guy do it this way, and it seems to work, is to rest right flat on the ground, like this, and actually sit on it. Very comfortable. I don't know how good it is for the drum, but it's never damaged mine. Obviously you need a larger drum for that to work. Um, so that's one way. Now the third way would be when you're standing. Like this, under your arm. And most of them also come with a strap that's just made of the same cordage. So you can put that over your shoulder and you won't be afraid of dropping it then. Now a padded strap would be a lot more comfortable, but... So those are your basic ways to do it. Whatever you do, it has to be comfortable for you. So don't worry what I said to do. Figure out something that works for you and uh, just do it that way. But whatever you do, you want to make sure that it's going to be good for the long haul. And if you're playing for three hours or an hour straight practicing, you want it to be comfortable. So sit, sit up straight or whatever, whatever works for you. But I think sitting up straight is generally acknowledged to be better for, you know, avoiding injury to your shoulder or your hands or something like that. Okay, so that's posture. Um, now, the two basic strikes. Again, I keep things simple. If I'm playing with rock and roll music or folk music or something like that, or pop music that my friends are playing on guitar, what I do is basically a combination of one of two hits. You're striking the drum with your hands. Uh, you don't want to drive it like a maniac. Nice light touch. You want to make sound by correct form rather than the violence of your striking, uh, generally speaking. Uh, so, you have two basic hits. One of them is the bass hit, the thump, and you get that by striking this area, not the very center of the drum, but around here, generally speaking, in this zone. That's where you're going to get your bass drum. And generally speaking, whenever I hit with that, I'm hitting this whole area of my hand. So, not the fingertips so much, they're sort of raised a little bit. Um, they probably hit it too, but it's mostly through this part of my hand. Whereas whenever I do the, the, the other type of hit, which is, uh, I call it the ping, or the, the, high, hot, the high hit, or the high sound, I guess. <laughs> I'm hitting just in this area. So it doesn't matter where you hit it around the drum as long as it's, it's, it's how far it is from the center or the rim that determines what kind of sound you're going to produce, largely. And generally, whenever I do that high ping sound, I'm only hitting with this front portion of my hand, the first uh, two knuckles, I guess or that portion, that portion, not the back meaty part. So in other words, part of the difference in the tone is how much of your hand you're smacking down on that skin at any given time. So the bass and the high. Now there are probably ways to get the same tones uh, through different techniques, but that's how I do it. It's a combination of two different tones that's going to make up any different rhythm, any different uh, rhythm pattern that you're going to work out. And obviously you can get doing that with both hands. So try that now and, and just follow along with me for a second.
Oh yeah, take off your rings if you're wearing any rings. And I also recommend if you're playing for a while, take off your watch. Because they'll just get in the way of uh, free, free range of motion. Possibly roll up your sleeves. Now, whenever you hit the rim, you are going to be hitting some of this non-resonating non, uh, part, right? The, the rim of the drum, you're partly hitting your hand on that as well. So you don't want to smack down on that really hard because it's going to end up hurting the bony parts of your hand. So you want to have a sort of slap down like this. It looks a little funny, but you're not smacking down rigidly like that because that would drive the bones of your hand right into this, this rim, which technically is a metal ring. That's what holds the ropes down. And the wood and rim of the drum is no softer uh, than that. So you want a sort of rolling motion. Now for the drum hit in the middle, it is more of a direct hit because there's, you're not cracking your hand against the rim. So boom, straight down. As we said, in that sort of circular area, not the center, not the rim, but right in between flat smack down right there with the meaty part of your hand. All that portion is smacking down directly. The palm doesn't contact. It's all done with the pads of your hand and the fingertips. At least that's the way I do it. Now, the various patterns, you can get very technical, but for most uh, music that you'll play along to in, say, a jam session, uh, rock and roll, pop music, alternative, etc., um, you're going to be doing fairly simple stuff over and over again. Now, you can get more complicated doing... Again, I'm no master at it. Uh, the, the sky's the limit in terms of technicality, but for basic playing at a jam session, you don't really want to overdo it anyway. That's part of the etiquette of playing drums at a jam session, is you want to make sure that you, you know your instrument, that you don't just pick it up and start banging off, off tempo and throw the music off, or try to do something overly complicated when it's not called for. Uh, most country music, folk music, and uh, rock and roll doesn't require a lot of elaborate drum rolls, etc. Um, whereas jazz might or something like that. <clears throat> so, uh, some basic patterns, as we said. Practice that until you can get clearly a bass, a bass, and a high and a high. Bass, bass, high, high, bass, bass, high, high, bass, bass, high, high. something I threw in a bit different there um, to mute and stretch. That's one technique you can do if you get a lot more advanced is you can press down on this and adjust the tone. I can't do that while I'm playing, it's just a bit too advanced for my technique, but uh, it certainly is a possibility. Um, whenever you're playing, be mindful of your knuckles and the bones. You have the fleshy part of your, of your finger between the knuckles and then the undersides of your knuckles are very bony. And if you play in an incorrect way that's for you, find out what works for you, um, and you keep playing like that for even a few songs, you're gonna get really sore there. Um, so you need to find something that works for you. In other words, you're cracking down too hard on the rim most likely. Um, or maybe just overall hitting too hard. Don't get carried away. Most whenever I play, my hands almost barely come off the head. If you're raising your hands up unnecessarily, that's using up energy, possibly causing uh, injury, rotator cuff, carpal tunnel, whatever it is. You'll notice that whenever I do the bass note, I'm usually going with my dominant hand. I'm right-handed. So you might want to go mostly with your dominant hand.
Don't try to produce sound with your hand on the rim alone, uh, at least not for most of the song because you'll, it's possible, but it's going to really hurt your hand. <laughs> um, much better to get that ping sound by sl whipping your fingertips down. You're whipping them really lightly. You can play with just your fingertips. Fingertips is a different style, but uh, I generally don't find it produces loud enough sound. I like doing that with this one. Okay, well that's it, and uh, thanks for watching. I hope you have fun with it. Don't forget, the music is in you, the rhythm is in you. Uh, the drum is the most basic instrument you can get. You just gotta come to a, find a way that is comfortable through your body for that music to come out, and it will come. You can practice also with the metronome um, to, keep, to improve your timing, but generally speaking, don't worry about that at first. Just find a way to make the sounds come out clearly for you. Don't be afraid to get a little bit of you know, your body into it. It's almost like dancing while you play. Uh, while you play. With some practice it will come so thanks for watching uh, please consider subscribing to my channel and uh, enjoy your playing